women jugglers are rare throughout the world, except in the Asian Pacific Island group of Tonga, which is not far from Fiji. An entire country of nothing but women jugglers? How did that happen? I'm a professional juggler on an adventure to document the history of Hiko, a Polynesian culture where object manipulation of tui tui nuts is an ancient tradition, passed down from women to girls and where no men juggle. I'm thankful the tradition is still alive today. Everywhere I go, every girl, every woman knows Hiko, knows how to juggle. I can hand the tui tui nuts that I carry with me in the back of my scooter and hand them to anybody, girl or woman, and they will light up and they will begin juggling two or three, sometimes four or five. All of the history is just oral. There is no written history. Everything is passed down from generation to generation. Part of this journey is just finding out what is Hiko? What does that tradition mean? How did it evolve? Why do all the women and girls juggle? Tui Tui Nuts. How did it become a dance at the Queen Salote College? Was it a competition at the schools? Why is it just girls? Why is it just women? I guess that's all part of recording the story of Hiko that is not recorded and finding what the story is. You know, it, uh, most of the tourists, they they come to Tonga, they say about these people, they are so friendly. The people here in Tonga is special. You can see Tonga Island in the world map, but it's a little dot, and this is our paradise. about 150 islands in the Kingdom of Tonga and only about 36 are inhabited. What's the name of the tree? Tui Tui. Stop behind me. <laughs> did you know she could juggle? Yes. You did? Yes, every girl they can do the, the chaco, the hiko. We would never have thought about that being a special thing. We would have thought that was just the normal, that everybody on earth knew how to juggle that way. I just carry on what it has been traditionally done here at school. <laughs> An American television juggler and performance artist is in Nukolofa researching the unique history and development of Tongan juggling. I think you're very unique in the entire world. There's no one like you. And I don't know if you know how unusual the Hiko is and the Tonga jugglers are here because only girls do it. So there's an abundance of women jugglers here and it's beautiful. Where did you learn to do hiko? When I was small. I think six, seven years. Did you have competitions or was it just play? Just play like this. We play and we learn to do hiko. As far as I know, the hiko or the juggling was uh, a game done by girls. Every, every school and every you know, college here in Tonga, they do competition and then including the chuckle. A game, a competition, a song, a dance. 
It all revolves around throwing tui tui nuts into the air in a circular fashion called a shower, where juggling four to five is the norm and ten is the legend. The green fruit itself, they are the fruits that we use for chocolate. What are you doing? Weaving the leaves for the roof. You can see that for the rain, and it's also for decoration. When I was a little girl, we used to do hiko. I learned it when I was in primary school. I used to compete with my friends. So there's two in the in the right and one in the left, and then you and then you go like this, two, three, four, and then you start. You start chuckling. See? I start chuckling with two and then go up to three and then four. But you know, I'm a big girl now, but I'm not really good in four now. <laughs> we learn it from our um, from our elders. It's more like a activity, family activity, family activity for us at home. We do we compete each other and then we start chuckling and counting and who's gonna be the, yeah, gonna the, be the highest? The... Who's gonna go high in when you when you chuckle? Yeah. And is it who can juggle the longest as well? Yeah, yeah. 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 It, it's fun. It's fun for us though. <laughs> Why well, I've juggled better is like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We play Hiko since three kids. Hiko is passed from generation to another generation. They just learn it from their mother in their own village, from their grandparents, from their grandmother. But it's very unknown where does Hiko come from. We don't know. No one in Tonga nowadays knew exactly where Hiko originated from. According to the elders, it is Polynesian, but according to our tradition, it started from the underworld. The head of the underworld is a lady, a blind lady. Her name is Hikuleo. And whenever Hikuleo came onto the surface of the earth, she find different girls still outside their houses. What she did is, she snatches their eyes and then take it back to the to Bulotu, which is the place she stayed and give it to all the souls there. So the souls there will use the eyeballs for juggling. One day, there was a soul escape from a Pulotu, and he relayed the story to the Tongan people. So they start juggling. I don't think they, it, it is true, but that's, I think that's, uh, that's how they try to, to make sense of where Hiko came from. It's quite clear that nobody knows where Hiku comes from. There was a transition from the old religion to the new religion that Christianity came with, so everybody dropped everything. And uh, we forgot about Hiku and them. They are remembered only in the stories. I started going to regional juggling festivals in 1999 and I would say at the time the ratio of men to women at the festival would be 50 men to one woman. There are a lot of jugglers here, I'd say maybe 100, 150 and um, it would still probably be one woman to maybe 20 men. There just aren't that many female juggling performers. In Tonga, they actually juggle a pattern that we call the shower, which is where you pass one ball to a hand and then throw it back. So it's a constant pass, throw, pass, throw. The women there will do anywhere from three to five with legends of women doing seven or 10. 
Now this just really blows me away because I consider the shower to be more difficult than the typical American pattern, which is right hand throw, left hand throw, right hand throw, left hand throw, everything is the same and the pattern is slower. To approach juggling from the more difficult pattern is a really interesting perspective. I start with one ball in each hand, toss, pass, cross. The shower pattern I think is it's easier to conceptualize because you're concentrating on one hand throwing. You're throwing with one hand, catching with the other, and tossing left hand to right hand. But I think it's even harder to juggle in a shower. I think it's, it's more difficult because you your throws have to be very accurate. You have to have very accurate throws and they have to be high enough. So the more nuts, we'll say, that you can juggle, the higher you have to throw them. So if you're doing four, it's a lot harder than three. If you're doing five, it's a lot harder than four. So it's, it's, it's having very accurate throws and being consistent. So it's, it's really, shower is difficult. The world record is eight. That's, that seems almost impossible. <laughs> that means that the pattern has to be really high, really, really high. And that takes years of practice. The fact that there's a country with only women jugglers is kind of a utopia. It is very fascinating that, that it's only women and that it's happening today and that they don't know about like any of the other juggling patterns. I can't believe it exists. I was starting doing Tahiko when I was 10. In a primary school. I mean, lunchtime, we play. <laughs> we used to climb in this tree when we were in primary. We call it a tui tui in Dongen. When the nut is coming out, it's to be like that. And we use this to make our our oil in Tonga. It's like a perfume smelling. It's smelling good. We can make it to chewing together with the nut and we make our body wash. Most of our home back there in Tonga, we have a tui tui tree there. And it helps us a lot because we use it as soap and uh, makes the tongue and skin very beautiful and very scented if we chew it or mixing it together with some other special leaves like spices. But it's good for the body. <laughs> and when it comes dry, we take out the outer hard shells, we collect all the white stuff inside and then we started collecting what we want to mix with it and we start chewing it. That's the tui tui and the mohokoi and cinnamon. This, all these things we make it for the tongan oil. So I don't. Can you just put all a little bit of it in? <laughs> if we use this and then we go stand on the sun, change the color of my skin oh. to brown. Yeah. My face will turn bright red. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Moist. Mm. Feels very nurturing. Mm. Yes. Smells good. Yeah. What we've made is a balm and it came from the tui tui nut that we were juggling, this is what was taken out of the shell, and the flowers. And what were the flowers called? Mohokoi. Mohokoi flowers. One, two, three. Pua, pua, kaumo, tau, toki, ana, pua, bye, bye. Bell, bye, bye. the first time I've heard the rhyme was at primary school in Nukalofa. But you know, the language is so different from the language of the Tongan language of today. Some of the words, you know, we don't understand. 
Those words are not Tongan at all. Where did those words come from? What kind of words are they? There's some theories. So some of the older Tongan women might have some theories about that. The word is a mixer of different culture. It is the history that we came from Southeast Asia. It's the origin of the Tongan people. And they think that the word was composed by people once they migrate from one place to another. They came from place to place and they, they end up in Tonga. And by that time, they brought the words and they put them together. I heard from an old man uh, about the, in between 17 and 80 years old. And he said that the words of the juggling or the hiko was the counting system of the Tongan very ancient time. These days we are counting one, two, three, four, tahau atolfa. But in the olden days, when, it's, when they do the hiko canes, they are just chanting the word. And then it goes, the last line, if you are still on, then you win the cane. Instead of saying one, two, you say the words for, for, up to the ulu, and that's when you start again. I think fua fua means the first time doing something. Fua fua means like you carry it around. It might be related to the hiko. You know, it's like if you jungle something around. Beau toki anawa. Um, anawa to me is like a meditating or like a, my mind is thinking of something higher because I'm looking up and uh, throwing the hiko up the tui tui. And it says, Fai Fai Beafe Paki. Beafe Paki, that's when the two tui tui they crash to each other. Mama Tuki. Uh, that word Mama Tuki, uh, Mama means to chew. A tuki means crashing it. Uh, to make it soft. I apply it to the flesh of the dui dui. Some other words up to now, I, I don't know the meaning. It was passed on spoken. It was oratory. They pass on from one generation to another. And I think that's why it's different. But still, the meaning is yet to be found. This is the call of the Friendly Islands, a real tall one from Mukalofa. Our time is 4 minutes before 11. 11 o'clock on top of the hour would be our news headline. In 1972, there was the first South Pacific Festival of Arts held in Suva, Fiji. And that's how I, the first time I've had Hiko. We did Hiko, chuckling at school, but I thought it was just a game. So that was the first time I've seen, you know, the girls doing the chuckling as an exhibition, you know, of culture. Putting the Hiko into dance, you know, was done by the Queen Salote College. They put the words, you know, into music, and then they, you know, the girls danced it. In 1972, I was one of the students who performed the hiko. That was the first time we put a movement into the hiko song. We get together, some of the teachers and myself, and we create the dance of the hiko. And because we, we didn't know the meaning of the words, we just do the movement according to what the actual uh, juggling is done. Swaying around to get the nut from where it went, that's what we, we showed in, uh, in the dance. And since then, the college, they have the, the hiko dance as their main item. It's still going on there. When you see the Higo dance is done anywhere, it came to your mind that is Queen Charlotte College item. I'm proud of what the college was doing, putting dance into the Higo so that it can be brought along 
years after year. Most of the people know that in, in Queen's Island, the colleagues, we do a lot with the community and the church and the royal family. These days we have male teachers who can really sing and um, put together a string band. We had the lari, the tongue and the wooden drum. It beats with the rhyme too. So the lari and guitar, and then the, the students are singing them in, in their own parts. There are dancers who, who do the movements according to how you do it. And there are some girls sitting down doing the real chuckling. That is what we are known for, is when we do things in group. It is like the unity of the moment, the way they do it. So be neat and, and look that they have one action at a time. We decide on what costume that the students are using, but most of the costumes of the girls are done by their mothers. Most of the costumes that we use are from leaves of certain plants here in Tonga. Or we can decide on a tapa. There are different kinds of Tongan costumes with different names that are made from tapa clothes. Or the very fine mats, you can do the costume out of that as well. <laughs> the, the costumes are decided by the teachers and their students, and then we ask the mothers. So the mothers are doing the hard work. The leaves is clear. They have to go and cut down the leaves. They put the leaves on the seed. After one week or two weeks, they go and cut it, and it's going to white like that. And they roll it, and they come and make it like this. All this stuff is from the coconut leaves, but this one is from the sea. They, they put the oil on our body because when they come and put the money on us, and the money did, did not fall down. They put money inside That's my dress mind. or mm. <laughs> my chest or they putting on my skin like that. This money is all mine. <laughs> Everybody that knew Queen Salote loved her. She spoke beautiful English. She was very well educated. She became queen very early in her life. She was 18, I believe, when her father died. The ages I lived in Tong were from seven until 12. There was a very close relationship between mother and dad in the royal family. Dad was promoted to the position of British agent and consul to the Kingdom of Tonga in 1949. Tonga is not a colony, it is its own independent kingdom, but it is a British protectorate. Therefore, my dad's position there was to be a, a liaison between the British government and the Tonga government, or Queen Salote. She was just such an interesting, enlightened, educated person. Her talents went many directions. She's very fascinating. She understood the value of maintaining the arts in Tonga and the culture and encouraged her people to learn the dances and to maintain the dances. She understood the need to uh, pass on the knowledge of being Tongan. Queen Salote, she, she was the greatest poetess here in Tonga. She used to uh, compose songs and using a very, um, a very touching words to express her idea. 
And even now, her compositions are still, you know, popular. She knew a lot about the culture, the history, and the, you know, the customs. And she was the one who set up the Tonga Traditions Committee in the 1950s. Because she was queen of an independent kingdom, she had stature and status that not many other people had. Queen Salote was one of the few elite that was invited to the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. London, the morning of Tuesday, June the 2nd, the morning of Coronation Day. After the coronation, all of the dignitaries of royalty and other important people were in a procession that went back to Buckingham Palace. The procession that went back of these dignitaries were in open air carriages. It started to rain on this procession. The carriages stopped and the various um, attendants got out and put up the carriage tops so that the dignitaries and uh, whoever wouldn't get wet. Well, the attendant came to Queen Salate's carriage and was ready to put her carriage top up and she said no. She said, I, I don't want it up, I want it down. That the rain was good, it made things grow, and that it was all right to get wet. She knew that the British people had come out, stood for hours in this rain to see all of these interesting people. And she was, by gosh, gonna give them a show. And she did, and she'd wave to one side and she'd tell the Sultan, you wave on that side and I'll wave on this side, you know, and to show her appreciation to the British people. That night, they found Queen Salote's maid cowered in the front room, frightened out of her mind. She said the phone had been ringing. There'd been people coming to the door knocking and she didn't know who it was. And she was afraid. She didn't know if it was good people or bad people. Finally, they were able to find out that these were reporters. They all wanted to know about Queen Salote, this queen who had written in the procession in the rain. And overnight, literally, Queen Salote became, a, I'd say, a superstar. From there on, there was no way they could travel in London without a huge group gathering. And they went to Scotland and Ireland after that, after they left London. And the crowds were there too, fl throwing flowers, bouquets in hand, you know, waving. Into Sydney comes Her Majesty Queen Salote of Tonga, who is returning to her Pacific Island home after attending the coronation. During a brief stay in the city, Queen Salote gave Pathé her first ever newsreel interview. I had a most wonderful trip to England to attend the coronation of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. I met the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh several times, and they are most charming. The coronation was a great occasion, and the memory of it, of it will never die. Although I got a good soaking, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. And now that I'm back in Sydney, I'm very pleased, not only to be here amongst friends, but it's a step nearer home. I remember my grandma, my mother, uh, speaking of the late queen, Queen Salote. She said she's a very loving and kind, queen and very humble, come down to earth for her people. My moms and her ancestors, they wanted to, to follow the path, the good path that the, the late queen teaches the people of Tonga. She helped to empower women to be very powerful and to be very knowledgeable in their role as women in the Tongan society. She loved her people and she loved Tonga. She was very honored queen, and uh, she's well remembered. Before Tatu Itonga, we, we were slaves of the kings and the nobles. If we say something, we're gonna be killed. Our lives were under the control of the nobles and the kings. But King George to both the face, he gave our freedom on the 4th of June, 1862. And in 1875, he gave our constitution. And in our constitution, we are free from the bondage of the chief uh, abusing us.
So all the Tongan tents and the hiko and such are doing just to show our respect and show our appreciation in what the king has done to us. He was the founder or the maker of modern Tonga. It is the role of the commoners just to do the dancing to make the nobles and those in the higher rank to be satisfied with what they are doing. They sit there and relax and let the others do the to the Higo. And Tonga's way of differentiating between the royalty and the nobles and then the common people. I understand that at some points it was the way of life and that uh, the common person's life was worth as much as the next rock, <laughs> you know, or, you know, and it was dispensable and, and, and their purpose for living was to serve. That was there before Captain Cook arrived in Tonga. When he arrived in Tonga, he noted that there was a big difference in the common people and, and then also the royal household. At the moment, we still have that. Today is not like the past uh, century. You know, we are in the new millennium nowadays. It's a very big change in uh, the way that we do things for the king. The king and the nobles, they love us. They gave us their uh, estate. They give and distribute it to people. And we live there as our own. Before, in the last century, it was the king and the nobles who were having the chance of going and have better education. But nowadays, commoners do have a chance to go to universities and go overseas and study and have better education. It's been a long time since I do this one and it's still a bit shaky. My auntie, she sit back on her heels and she used to do seven. And it's beautiful to see because she can control the thing going around the air. Now, I would like to be like that one day, but it's a bit too late now. I'm getting old too, so. Why, wait, wait, what? Men don't do hiko? Why do men not juggle? How was it? What do you hiko? They never used to it. They only play marbles and climbing up on the coconut trees and everything. Eh? Would you want to learn to play hiko? No! <laughs> and why? That's girl stuff, is <laughs> Hiko is more like a woman's role. If a man is doing the hiko, he will be mocked by other boys because he is doing female's work. Here in Tonga, the women are higher rank than the men. The men have to go to the bush and do the plantation. They cut the firewood. They have to look after the family, everything. And then the easy work will be done by women. They do not join in the war. They were staying home. They have nothing to, to do. They used the orange, the lemon, what they got from the trees, just to spend their leisure time. <laughs> Hiko is strictly a female pastime in Tonga. The other thing that is female is the weaving of mats and the taking care of the tapa cloth. Women, we have been well treated. We were always like a um, special case in the family, especially if you are the eldest daughter. The older sister in a family is higher in ranking to their brothers and their brother's children. At home, it is not allowed for the brothers to touch the sisters. At home, our brother are not allowed to enter the bedroom of sisters. And brother is not allowed to touch anything that owned by sisters. And at night time, if the sisters are going to somewhere, there must be a brother who will follow the sisters to make sure 
that he will take care of the scissors on her way to the store and then come back home safely. Ever since I was grown up, the boys, they play a bit far away from the girls. We don't uh, mix together or play together as groups. I remember when we are grown up, uh, we have like two uh, big tongan houses. The boys sleep on their own and we sleep on our houses. It's one of our um, customs and traditions. Tonga, there is a traditional way of performing wedding ceremonies. It includes multiple days. There's a ceremony to do with the fact that the female is a virgin. This is the first time for the husband and the wife to have sexual intercourse after the marriage. Then the sheets that were, that were used packed it and the husband gonna take it to his family to show that, that his wife is virgin. There is a big ceremony that involves that and it's a day of pride for the mother and the father and, and her family, her whole family rejoices and is very happy that she has maintained her virginity until um, her time with her husband. They consider that somebody who is worthy for their son. Respectability comes, you know, with maintaining that and, and living with your parents. If the kid's not virgin, you know, there will be gossip around the husband's family and they never forget it. Whether the son has been a virgin or not, that doesn't, you know, that's not anything that is of any concern. And uh, it's because they are men and, um, you know, God made them different. Men are different than women. There's different strengths. They're, di they're, they're different emotionally. They're different in, in physical strength. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. In the nuclear family, the man is the head of the house. He will have the final decision. The eldest son will be the Ulumotua. If someone is passed away, he will be the leader. No woman is, uh, is a Ulumotua. In the law of the country, the land could be uh, inherited by male only. If our parents have only two girls, their land will be taken away to someone else because there is no son over there. There are roles that are done by men, which is not done by women. There is a saying, the women's place here in Tonga is at home. They have to stay behind at home, looking after children, to the housewife and such. We haven't uh, have a noble as a female. Beginning of the parliament here in Tonga, there were only men, no female governor. That is what we, we have come across now. Might be later on in the future, we might have these people, but uh, at the moment, these are what we have in our government. There is a need to educate people so that they understand the role of women. They can do the thing that the men are doing in parliament. Most of the time, the hika dance is performed to the royal um, members, and it's a very great honor for us to perform to our king and queen or any member of the royal family in Tonga. In Hiko, it, it is quite interesting because if you are a performer, you're going to have to master all the skills. The hand coordination, body balancing, and also the concentration on all the tree nuts that you're throwing up in the air. Most of the girls did four or five. You admired the girls that juggled eight. At least I did greatly because I knew I could never get that many. But it was nice to know that it could be done and maybe that was something you could strive to do. By learning the hiko, it reminds us of how to behave good and be respected. 
and to think of yourself that women, they are very important in the society. We were like a princess in our family, moving around and showering the candle nuts into the air. It gives us some proudness. We were very fortunate at that time if we have been selected to be part of it at school. It's a big thing for us at that time. You feel beautiful and um, the movement, it's emotional, like um, sexy. You feel the happiness in you. I am one of the face Hiko dance at the Queen Salad. Charcoal, four, sometimes six. I can do three now. <laughs> Give me one so I can try four. See, it's good to practice, eh? I'm tired. <laughs> yeah, I bet you are. Well. <laughs> It still hurts. As a student in school, you, you can feel nothing. <laughs> it really hurts when you um, start doing it after 30 years. So this is the first time you've done Hiko in 30 years. Yeah, that's right. It is. It needs a lot of practice. <laughs> but the, the younger ones, they're eager to have it um, done to, to really do it. I think these days not every girl know, know how to do the chuckling. In, in our days, we don't have no, any canes, so that's what you can afford to have. Because you don't have to buy the tui tui floats, you can just pick them from the trees at home and start practicing the hiko. You created your own entertainment. There was no TV, of course, back then. There was very little that wasn't right there on the island that you could use or make in, into a game. If you had nothing else to do, so you got the hiko nuts and you sat around and practiced for you know an hour here, an hour there, and it was it was yeah, <laughs> it was a game. These days they have video, they have TV, and maybe the young girls of these days don't have any time to chuckle. And we put Hiko in the field events, our school sports. The best one will go for long and longer and longer. She will win the medal. And the second will be the silver medal. And the third will be the bronze medal. But since from last year, we leave the Hiko from the events of our school sports because we didn't have enough money to to buy or to finance some metals for that. I think Hiko will be lost later because we are busy in different sports. That is one of our materials to preserve to, for the next generation. It is our responsibilities because Hiko is a part of our culture in Tonga. If we emphasize and do it at school, do it in their physical education, do it in their competition, maybe we will preserve to, for the next generation. If that art ever get lost to the youth, it's a, it's a, it's a big loss. You know, that's an art and that's a, a subject that's very important that the young adults and the youth can learn. It's very interesting how the Tongan community formed here in Euless, Texas. 
a Tongan couple first moved here back in the 1980s. They transferred over here with the airlines when Dallas-Fort Worth Airport was being built. The DFW Airport was going to bring a lot of jobs to the area. The cost of living was inexpensive. It was a great place to raise a family. Tongans are a community-oriented family and tradition and all of those things binds them together and so it was only natural that they all drew to each other, formed the church so they can have a communal place to be able to be Tongans and to share their culture and their custom and the language and maintain uh, the core things that makes us Tongan. Since then we've had a, a growing of the Tongan community here and we have 12 churches in the area. Most of how the culture is transitioned over here to this area is done through the churches. As a pastor's wife and as a leader of the women's department, we are very blessed to work here and take care of the 47 families in the Free Wesleyan Church in Euless. They count coming to church as one of the important things to uh, keep them going and staying here in the United States. The members are very supportive by the mayor from the city about our children's education. We had an event last night that was hosted by the Ulysses Tongan Community Committee. It was an event to help promote higher education for the Tongan youth of Texas and to um, help encourage the youth here to go to college and go to universities and receive their degrees. To come here to America and to leave their homeland for a better life and to provide that and to struggle at working menial jobs for their children, it, it's a big sacrifice for them. And it is our duty to try and help ease that. And to ease that, we believe education is the great equalizer. I'm sure everybody misses the the ease and the comfort and the slow paced lifestyle back home, but the ability to be able to provide food and shelter and a warm home and, and, and to do all of those things, those are trade-offs. All the Tongans here in the community here is in a very unique place because we're living history, we're developing, we're making what's going to happen and how this community is going to be like in 10, 15, 20, 30 years. I hadn't done Hiko since I was maybe eight or nine uh, when I left Tonga and came here. I don't believe I've ever seen Hiko discussed or performed. Honestly, there's a lot of things that we lose in coming here to America and after with the first generation of kids that are born here in Texas, I'm sure they don't, they probably never heard the word Hiko. You know, it's something that kind of slowly fades out uh, because uh, there's other things more pressing to take care of. The ages I lived in Tong were from seven until 12. I'm sorry that I didn't teach my grandchildren. You just don't think about it. I was 12 when I left Tonga and I'm now 73. It's been over 60 years. So I went to HEB and, and bought the hardest limes I could find. And I was juggling the other night to show the grandkids and they said, oh, Nana, you can juggle. Hey, wait, let me get my video camera. They got their phones and they videoed me juggling and said, we're gonna send these to our friends. <laughs> You're doing something we can't do. And I thought, hooray, finally. I mean, there's some few things that I can do better than they anymore. I mean, it's, it's, it's a reversal here. I'm, <laughs> so I'm enjoying being able to do something they can't. I'm 73. We came here in 1981. I remember that at, when I was at, still at school, Queen Salade College. Yeah, started two 
Next time, three. I'm long, long time. I never do that. But I, I like it. It's an exercise for me, for my hand, both hands. <laughs> <laughs> in Euless, Texas, I want to bring Hiko into life by teaching the women and the girls and my children too. I'm hoping that some of the women here can help pass that on to the next generation of kids, help preserve our uh, Tongan culture here in this new home that we have in Euless, Texas. It's fun, especially when you're young, but not now when you become a mother. I have no time to do these things. You call, finish, 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 finish. Whoever wins is the one who got the $1,000. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us, we, we didn't have a job. So when I see the, the whole program last night, it gave me an idea you can bring more money to your family by doing the chuckling. It's very good for us to do something for living. It bring me more idea what I can do in the future. <laughs> chuckling for me, I, I didn't thought they are, it, it's gonna make money. But when I, I see the, your program last night, it's, it's a surprise. I, uh, I learn a lot. I'm thinking of uh, maybe one day I probably me or my kids become uh, one of the best uh, chuckling in the world. You never know. Maybe one day somebody can do chuckling um, program here in Tonga. So our kids can learn how to do it. Tongan people, they can do anything. those girls throwing back and forth to each other in patterns immediately that usually take a while for people to get. Mostly men juggle. Many men juggle, very few women all over the world. So you in Tonga are very unique. This is the first time for an overseas friend to come and try to remind us the importance of Hiko and tell us that Hiko can be one of the future career for the kills. Ha <laughs> ha! 
<laughs> you like this kind of juggling? <laughs> no. No? <laughs> in our primary schools, in our high schools. We still have to pass on from one generation to another how to do Tahiko. It is changing, but bit by bit, but still we try to keep and pass on Tahiko from one generation to another. I think it will uh, stay longer like that. I believe if we continue to teach our girls Hiko, no matter what age they are, just let them try. It will give them the pleasure of having this happiness and being well respected at that time. Women is at home. From my experience, they always said it. But because of the development of, and the civilization now, women is much better than men. The women's right in Tonga, is, it's just like overseas. Women can vote. They can be a member of parliament or ministers. Like today, the minister of education is a woman, and some of the government you know, departments, their bosses are you know, women. Women can have businesses, they're free to do anything except the land. They can lease the land, but they can't own the land. Women are having a say at the moment. The people put forward the idea that every woman can do the same role as the men. Nowadays, there are female doctors, female lawyers. They were, you know, female carpenter. So they put forward the right that a woman here in Tonga could have. That is the same with the right of a man. They can become a minister in the, in the government. They can, uh, they can run the election. They can debate in the legislative assembly. They can do anything, so they, uh, they had a move so that, that women will go into the parliament. It's an honor for families to have children who work for, you know, for a living and to work uh, for the government, and especially at higher positions, maybe in the government jobs in Tonga. I, I believe it's an honor for a family to have a female child that is um, educated and smart enough to be able to hold a, and, and acquire a position um, of rank in Tonga. I still am amazed that it, it's so unusual for women to juggle because it never crossed our mind that it, it was that special. We, we just did it. When the hiko is uh, done everywhere, I, I, I think it's uh, part of myself. Hiko means a lot to me. It gives you life. It gives you youth. You don't feel your age old. <laughs> you think you're still young. <laughs> it reminds you who you are and how important you are. It doesn't matter where you travel or where you stay in the world, but you remember you are a girl from Tonga. It will give you positive mind and keep you going wherever you are. You have a good soul, happy soul, and you always wanted to share. I think that's the importance of teaching Hiko.